then we can start. So on the last session we had, we had someone asking about real world scenarios and I should have mentioned that we have one in the next session. So yeah, we Camel K in action, an evolution from e, uh, ESB to cloud native API in the chronicle variation and I'm sorry, we're just breaking. Sorry, I don't know if it's on my breaking. end. I don't know if it's on my end. Andre, I was hearing the same thing. Okay. Great. All right. All right. I think I can hear my echo. I think I can hear my echo. Jeff, can you go on mute just, just for now? Clear. Jeff, can you go on mute? Okay, I think that's better. All right, cool. Um, so let's uh, let's kick that off. Um, so I'm super excited to to kick this off. <clears throat> I just call it Camel in Action. Um, so it's um, it's going to be like a real world scenario we want to talk about today. And um, so yeah, I think we got about half an hour time. Um, and basically, what we want to talk today is we want to talk about Camel K. Uh, we want to talk about uh, what kind of options companies have today to build their own integration platform. So because Camel is all about integration, so that's what we want to talk about today. And um, yeah, there's there's an interesting journey uh, going on from like the old ESB world to now having cloud native um, API integration. Um, and uh, this is basically what we want to talk about today and the journey from the Chronicle of Higher Education, how they went through this journey. So um, the first slides are going to be uh, more me talking about uh, Camel K uh, in general and uh, the evolution. And after that, so after about 15 minutes, um, I'm going to pass it over to Jeff, uh, who is here with me, uh, who's the director of product engineering um, at the Chronicle of Higher Education. And uh, he has been using um, Camel extensively, um, <clears throat> and we helped him uh, introduce Camel, and um, they they built a, uh, um, a pretty impressive platform uh, based on based on Apache Camel, um, and they are transitioning into this cloud native world now, and that's basically what we want to talk um, talk uh, about today. Um, so let me make a quick introduction. So my name is Andre. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of Datagrade. Uh, we're a consulting company. We have been working with um, Apache Camel for almost over 10 years now. Uh, so we started using it in 2011. Um, and uh, we're super satisfied with Camel and uh, we just want to talk more about it. And uh, we just released a new tool, uh, which is called JADIC, the JADIC platform, uh, which is basically going to be the first cloud native iPaaS solution uh, based on Camel K. Based on so Camel K. Uh, what we want to so, do is we want to enable users uh, to make more uh, with Camel K in the future because we absolutely think it's going in the right direction. Um, so that's about me. Maybe Jeff, if you want to introduce yourself real quick. Yourself, real quick. Sure. Uh, I'm having some connectivity issues. I'm hoping you can hear me. Um, we've got a windstorm rolling through Baltimore with some thunderstorms behind. So I'm hoping uh, my connection stays strong. I'm Jeff, Jeff Bruns, the Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, I've been there about uh, seven years, going on eight. Um, and it's been uh, an evolution of iteration um, over the course of, of a pretty uh, important part of the Chronicle's history um, as a as a publication, so I'm looking forward to talking about it. Okay, great, thanks, Jeff. Um, all right, so as I mentioned, uh, we want to um, give you guys the picture here of the evolution of enterprise application integration, and EA, EAI is basically uh, the problem what Apache Camel is solving. Um, so when we look back into the maybe 1970s, 1980s, that was the time when uh, companies started to use more than one application. 
Uh, so at this time, they were having like, um, at this time, very small ERP applications, uh, where they were trying to process all the data in one, in one application. And as more and more applications came to the market, they were facing the issue that they have to uh, basically integrate uh, these systems somehow. So <clears throat> I would say from the research I did about in the 80s, that's kind of when this problem evolved. Uh, due to the fact that more applications were hitting the market and that it was just becoming more and more popular for, for companies uh, to basically incorporate ERP systems um, into their evolving IT landscape. So what they basically did is uh, they, they just didn't know how to do it. So um, bigger companies like IBM came up with some uh, messaging frameworks. They were using uh, databases a lot. So multiple applications were basically dipping into the into the same um, into the same database. I guess that's what we would call, call today a data lake. Um, they were starting to to do some some batch files, but that was all custom coded. So there was no real integration solution you could you could use for that purpose. Uh, so they just had to hand code everything. And it was a tedious process. It took them a long time to figure all that stuff out. And that really took a long time. Um, until I would say about in the in the late 90s, that's basically when this concept of ESB, which stands for Enterprise Service Bus, evolved. Um, <clears throat> so the um, some some large software vendors just saw a market to build um, to build software tools uh, solely for integration to to just solve any kind of integration problem or challenge. Uh, so they came up with these uh, with these ESBs, and they had the idea: well, let's create this platform, put in as many uh, connectors as we can, put in as many patterns as we can uh, to basically enable customers connect their applications uh, rather quickly. So, from my perspective, and we as a company did a lot of stuff on the ESB. It was a great idea, was a great concept, because at, I would say in the 2000s, that's when really the number of applications. Uh, was growing rapidly, um, so that the companies needed to have some some sort of solution for that, um, and and the number of uh, like uh, the amount of data was was increasing significantly at that time as well. Now, <clears throat> the reason I have a bomb here is what basically happened after that is that uh, if you do a little bit of research, that companies started putting so much logic into the ESBs that it just became at a point where it was a big monolithic application, uh, which was not uh, flexible or agile enough uh, uh, to handle the, the rapidly changing um, landscape, IT landscape of today's companies. Um, so, and this is why there are articles out there who like they are maybe 10 years old even, where they predict that ESB is dead. So, and what they basically are saying is, not that the use case or the problem or the challenge is that it's just the way we we used to solve it using like a big monolithic application um, is not the way going going forward anymore um, we need to have a more agile a more flexible solution to do that um, and basically what i'm seeing right now in the market um, is that with the evolution of something like Camel K, with the um, evolution of the cloud providers like AWS, Azure, um, <clears throat> and then also with uh, Kubernetes, that there's really a, a chance for the, for the integration to kind of use these technologies and build way more flexible and agile integration platforms. And um, we call this cloud native integration. Um, and that's basically what we want to talk today about. So, <clears throat> That being said, um, you as a company today have basically three large options on how to solve an integration challenge. So one is the traditional. That is a little bit coming from the ESB world where you have large software vendors uh, such as MuleSoft or maybe Oracle or IBM offering this kind of big solution. And that, that isn't necessarily bad, but it comes with plus and minus. So this is what I mean with traditional software vendor uh, giving you an integration platform. Um, on the right hand, we have this newly uh, upcoming iPaaS providers. I do like them, um, but they all share like one big problem, and that's basically that they don't offer enough flexibility. 
So <clears throat> as you have a look in the middle here, it's kind of custom coding. So the question is, can we custom code our own integration hub? The answer to that is yes, you can, but there are some drawbacks. And let's have a look at what these drawbacks are and how we can, how we can solve them. So going back into the traditional world, um, basically uh, think about um, modern ESBs being very feature rich, being enterprise ready, being able to solve kind of any challenge. But the downside is they're complex and you really have to know on how to implement them. And the other one is you get a very, very big vendor lock-in, a very large one. I have not seen companies being able to migrate or move away from an existing traditional um, enterprise integration hub quickly. It takes years and years and years because there's so much stuff baked in. You cannot simply go away from that. So you have this vendor lock-in and that can be a big issue. Um, the iPaaS providers on the other hand, they are cool. They are uh, like maybe a little bit light white. Uh, they are all in the cloud. Um, so you have this reduced maintenance effort. Um, but on the other hand, you have limited capabilities because they are also new. They, they don't offer, they don't have like 10 or 15, 20 years of background in integration to offer you all the capabilities you need. You, you might still have old SOAP services running um, and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And they, they might not offer that because they focus on the, on the, new, on the new stuff only. Uh, which is great, but which just limits your capabilities. Okay, so let's custom code this stuff. Well, if we custom code it, um, then we're of course have the total flexibility. We can take any framework, we can code, you know, if we have the skill set in house, what might be a problem, but if we have the skill set, we can code whatever we want to code, right? Um, in looking, looking at all the frameworks such as uh, Apache Camel, they might help us do that. Um, but still, it requires in-house skill set because we need to spin up the full integration environment using CI, CD, and maybe a lot of stuff you learned today and maybe yesterday, what you can do using Apache. But it's still a lot of work. Um, so you have a high effort to maintain this solution. Uh, so looking at that picture, you can basically see on the lower left and right side, you have the traditional ESP and the iPaaS. Um, you have to buy them. You won't own the solution because you have a vendor here. Um, one has limited capabilities, but is quicker to implement. The other has more capabilities, but creates an even bigger uh, implementation challenge. Uh, and you have to have integration experts to do that. Custom coding, on the other hand, lets you do everything and lets you own the solution, um, but you have to have the skill set. Um, all right, so as we're talking about Camel K today, uh, this is basically where Camel K, from my perspective, and that's why, why I really love Camel K, the, way, the day I saw it and learned about it, is it tries to remove these issues in open source uh, solution usually provides. Um, and that basically means we wanna lower your maintenance effort. We wanna enable you to create an integration, to deploy it onto a Kubernetes environment without handling um, about all the stuff like CI, CD pipelines and everything, what you might need or might not need. We just wanna, we just wanna make sure you can do that quickly. Um, <clears throat> so, and this is basically what Apache Camel K does. So I think I don't wanna spend too much time on Apache Camel because I think nobody, uh, everybody here in this uh, talk probably knows what Apache Camel is. What I do like about Apache Camel is that they started doing and working on it in 2007. I tried to look it up on GitHub and going all the way back, I found some articles and it looks like they, the first commit was around 2007. And since then, they, the framework has evolved. So it really has every, every little detail, everything you can think about, it has baked in. So there is really no reason to reinvent the wheel and build anything from scratch or do some sort of custom coding without using a framework such as Apache Camel. Um, I think the Camel in Action book is great and I still open it from time to time and find new things where I'm like, oh, I didn't know that this exists or that you can do that with Camel um, because they have been working on it for 15 years and now they are polishing it even further, which, which I really appreciate and which I like. Um, so as you can see on that slide, Apache Camel makes it super easy for you to um, 
integrate anything, transform anything, and handle any kind of integration challenge you can think of. I've never run into a situation where I'm like, I can't do that with Camel. I need to custom code anything. It, it, it just never happened. Um, so that, that, that's great. Um, now, what we have to do is we have to bring in Kubernetes now because Kubernetes will now enable us to, um, to, to find a platform where we, can, where we can run and where we can scale Camel. But the problem is bringing that into Kubernetes, it requires a lot of knowledge on, okay, how can I operate uh, Kubernetes? How can I build a Docker container? How can I push that into Kubernetes? How can I maintain that on Kubernetes? So there's like a lot of question asked and maybe some, here, some people here in the audience might be like, well, that's no problem. We can deal with that. That's fine. But there's a lot of people out there who can't deal with that or maybe have not the time to deal with the little details going into the Camel and Action Book and figuring out all the little details you have to know. Um, so I think that in the future, every kind of integration will run on Kubernetes. Um, it has just grown so quickly over the last few years, and it's now becoming the de facto standard. Uh, we are a member of the Cloud Native uh, Computing Foundation. Um, for, for somebody who doesn't know that, it's a great foundation. It's basically where they put the code, where Google uh, uh, committed the code for, from Kubernetes into, um, and it's it's a very very large uh, community now. Um, as you can see here on that slide, you can really see uh, on on Google like how the virtual machine searches went down and the Kubernetes searches uh, got up significantly, and it makes it so much easier to run your applications. And I'm sure there were many many talks. Uh, who were who were presenting about why it makes sense to go to Kubernetes and why it makes sense to do microservices, and the same is true for for um, for integrations. Um, okay, so Camel K. Um, to look into that picture here, Camel K makes it now really easy for you to do that because you only have to focus on the DSL. Remember, two two slides ago, I was showing uh, that it only needs three lines of code, basically like the real DSL code to connect to Salesforce, grab some data and put it into a file or do whatever you want to do with that. It just takes three lines of code. So I guess the idea behind Camel K is let's only focus on these three lines of code because that's what I want to achieve. That's, that's the business challenge I have to solve. These three lines of code, everything else is just IT stuff uh, and it's just time consuming. And that's basically where Camel K comes into play, where Camel K takes care about how to build the Docker container and how to push it into Kubernetes. So at the end of the day, the only thing I have to do is I have to install something and operate it once in my Kubernetes, and I just have to hand over this uh, DSL file to uh, the Camel K operator. The Camel K operator will take it and will make sure that it spins up the containers and run them in Kubernetes. We've done that. We've, we've been using that for quite some time, and it works great. It, it's awesome. You don't have to deal with anything anymore, basically. You just have to know a little bit about the DSL. So if you look into, into that one here, you can see on the left side before Camel K, you have the complex code. You have uh, your IntelliJ with all the stuff up and running. You have to worry about your build pipeline. You have to install that and bring that up somehow. Uh, and then you have to deploy it. Now, after Camel K, you have one file, you have one command line, and, you, and that creates one pod. So you can basically create an API and expose that on Kubernetes. If you've installed the, the, the operator, you can do that literally in 60 seconds. Um, and I think nobody else can do that. Um, there's nobody else who can build an API or build an integration or build any kind of software that quickly and deploy it safely and run it safely uh, um, and reliable on Kubernetes. So this is basically how it looks like. Before Camel K, you have all this stuff going on. After Camel K, you just put in these two lines of code and you're done. And the rest gets handled by the framework, which is unique. I haven't seen any other operator pattern using it that way. And I think the guys who created it have done a great job. Um, it's very interesting. And I would even get so far as saying that other frameworks maybe Apache Beam or uh, NiFi or whatever could participate from that experience and could maybe create something similar, which would be great. So the beauty is if you put in the cloud vendors 
you don't create any kind of vendor lock-in. So you basically have eliminated your vendor lock-in. You have eliminated the high maintenance effort because remember, Camel K now takes care about a lot of things. Um, and thanks to the cloud providers like AWS, Azure, Google, or whoever you take, they all provide Kubernetes. So you're getting rid of the maintenance effort or the skill set which would be required to maintain the Kubernetes platform. So you can just spin it up and then you can create your, uh, your integrations in the DSL code using Camel K and you can basically lift and shift it anywhere. So you can today deploy it into, uh, uh, into an AWS Kubernetes cluster. Tomorrow you can, you can push it to Google uh, or you can even run it locally in your mini cube if you're fancy enough to do that. Um, so it, it kind of really brings together and fills the gap for the people who want to build an integration platform using custom coding uh, without being locked in into a specific vendor. Um, and this is basically what we do, did at, um, or basically the journey um, at the Chronicle of Higher Education. So maybe Jeff, if you want to take over and um, let us a little bit know on how this went at your end. Sure, thanks Andre. Um, just confirming you can see and hear me okay. I've been kind of blipping in and out. Yep. Good, great. So um, I'm, I'm excited to be here and I like telling this story. Andre and I have done it a, a, a couple times. Um, the Chronicle's been around since um, the late 50s, early 60s and is known kind of in the industry as the Wall Street Journal of Higher Education. Um, we're a traditional publication. Our founder at his core was, was a journalist and a reporter. Um, and ultimately he segued that business into the nonprofit sector uh, which we also have a publication covering um, and we publish chronicle.com for higher education and philanthropy.com for nonprofits. Uh, the organization has been around for quite some time and we were early adopters of technology. Um, well before I kind of got my roots in technology, uh, our late founder Corbin um, had a specific intrigue into the internet and we were um, one of uh, very few organizations I know to own a slash 16 IPv4 uh, block. Um, so we've always embraced and thought about technology as a way to empower our business. Um, but we are an enterprise and we've been around for a long time and we've acquired a lot of information and technology silos along the way. Um, those ultimately have caused us to, to be slow, to, uh, to, 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 really have um, a lot of obstacles and challenges to get over to make one part of the business speak to another. Um, we cover um, the audience side, which is our publication, um, our subscribers, um, our, our customers to um, uh, things that we sell through our e-commerce pipelines like webinars, um, digital data reports, um, and other data-driven products. Uh, but we also offer recruitment services. We host job boards for nonprofit and for higher education. And all of those systems live in different silos, or should I say past tense? Uh, they lived in different silos. Uh, about two years ago, the organization was approaching an intersection of change uh, where um, we were kind of well within the decline of ad revenue, of, of print and circulation revenue. And we know that we, we knew that we needed to kind of redefine ourselves and look for, for other avenues to um, be sustainable and, and be able to kind of serve our market in the future. Um, as we approached this, this inter and I describe it as an intersection because it wasn't just technology or time, it was also people. Uh, the business pivoted uh, pretty significantly in that it, it replaced and, and recruited new executive leadership for each of our business units. Um, and around this time, um, our CTO, um, who is really a creative and innovative thinker um, in his own right, um, he and I and, and several others on the team kind of identified that, hey, we're going to need to pivot with all of these shifting changes, and we really need to think about integrations at an enterprise level. So we made the migration from this silo technology stack where we had PHP over here and we had we had Ruby on Rails over here, and we had Oracle, and we had Microsoft, um, and they were all specific siloed systems, some of which held their own developer teams, um, uh, but ultimately 
it really made integration within our organization very difficult. Um, so we started to think about how we can build out uh, uh, in an agile way, something that was sustainable in the future that allowed us to quickly pivot to market change. Uh, we teamed up with Andre and Datagrate um, and we implemented uh, Apache Camel in a way that allowed us to really think about enterprise integration um, at, a, at, at a holistic level where we're, we're talking about um, the, the, the framework that drives Apache Camel and, and connectors and being able to quickly iterate for uh, a, a request from the business to be able to, to integrate with this other system. So um, that took us to uh, about uh, end of summer 2020, and we've continued to evolve this platform that we've built um, using Apache Camel, using Spring Boot, um, using a bunch of other technologies. Um, and as we've started to kind of evolve this behemoth of an integration platform, um, we're leveraging the, the, the cloud native kind of uh, advantages that Kubernetes offers. Um, we're, we're starting to prototype different uh, Camel K implementations with Andre and Datagrate, um, and really thinking about how we can um, kind of change the approach to uh, CI, CD and, and kind of the traditional um, big uh, um, framework based vendor lock in kind of kind of challenges uh, and be able to kind of iterate a little bit, a little bit more quickly. Um, Andre, if you want to um, go on to uh, the next slide here, and I know we're coming up on time, I believe. Um, can I get a time check, Andre? Oh, we'll get a few minutes. So we're at uh, 26 minutes. OK, great. So, so ultimately, this is essentially what we built. Um, we built um, what we kind of think of as our golden record store. Um, it's a master data management platform. Um, at its core, it's a data store. Um, we have a transactional uh, data store. We use uh, uh, Amazon RDS, Aurora, the MySQL flavor, um, or I guess the other way around, the Aurora flavor of MySQL. Um, and ultimately, we used um, Apache Camel to develop a uh, an event driven uh, event based platform where data flows in a direction and is handled by the the, the, the mediation routes um, in accordance to if the data is coming in or if the data is going out. So at the top in the orange, you'll see um, microservices, each of which um, is a Spring Boot Apache Camel implementation. Uh, it has uh, RESTful API listeners that receive webhooks from things like or platforms like Shopify. Um, Stripe, um, um, Marketo, Workcast, Salesforce, um, that brings the data into the system. And as the data comes in, it gets integrated into our data store, uh, which is our enterprise system of record. Um, the green icons are our integration routes, and they're responsible for managing data at the object level. Um, so we know that an entitlement entitles a user to ac access to something they purchased um, or otherwise signed up for. Um, that's handled by a singular microservice. Um, we're able to quickly scale that from infinity or down to zero in some cases uh, as the, 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 the need uh, arises for either load or something that, that, that can be done on a predetermined schedule basis. So scaling to zero is something that, that we can do quickly and easily with Kubernetes in a fully automated way. Um, and ultimately, when the data runs through those integration routes, and gets stored in the data store, um, the, the framework, the platform that we build emits uh, uh, messages across pub sub um, um, topics that ultimately get consumed um, and received by other microservices, the ones indicated in purple that we call our off ramps. Someone purchases a subscription for a one year digital on Chronicle of Higher Education, chronicle.com. Uh, that entitles them to premium access, but we also have other packages. We call them bundles. Uh, for this particular bundle, someone purchases a subscription that also comes, um, uh, it, that also includes um, uh, credits for a webinar purchase on philanthropy.com, which we air live uh, uh, once a month. So that one purchase that runs through Stripe and gets indexed in Shopify ultimately gets fulfilled to our partner that's responsible for managing the paper, um, but also goes out to uh, Workcast, which provides 
um, our webinar fulfillment platform. Um, it goes out to Shopify to create a discount code that can be redeemed when the user clicks on the link on their email, which gets sent out of Marketo. So all of these systems, internal and external, drive many workflows, some of which are e-commerce, other of which are newsletters, some is corporate and advertisement sales, um, but at its core, it's Apache Camel. And this, the, the simplicity of being able to stitch the DSL together in a way that can leverage all of these connectors, um, it's really changed the way that, that, that we think about the software development lifecycle. We've really become agile. And in the eight years that I've been there, um, it's been a constant struggle to follow the best practices of Scrum and, and you know, agility and velocity and all of the things that, that we try to strive for um, kind of in our quest for excellence, um, to be able to iterate in such small uh, chunks and segments, have automation take that small change into a pipeline that incorporates automated QA and CI CD out to production to deliver a large value um, by touching other systems. Uh, it's, it's really, I mean, it's, it's really changed the course of the Chronicle and the way that we think about our business. Um, and as a kind of traditional newspaper and journal, uh, uh, journalistic outfit, um, we're a legacy. And, and it's something that, that a lot of our peers in the industry struggle with, but this has really helped us to think kind of tip of the spear in a way that um, we can leverage the open source community. We can leverage um, a, 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 a technology called you know, Apache Camel has been around for a long time with a, a huge amount of, of support in the community um, and be able to iterate on change quickly. Yeah, it, it's Jeff, it's really great to see how you basically create new products um, while gluing together existing applications using something like Apache Camel, right? It's basically, you're basically creating new products uh, using Apache Camel um, and existing software tools, right? Yeah, that's that's very very much the case because our customer is the business, and it could be the part of the business that is responsible for driving circulation revenue. It could be part of the business that's responsible for driving recruitment revenue. Um, but ultimately, that's our customer, and the products that we're delivering are sometimes feature enhancements, sometimes epics, um, sometimes full blown business integrations with new partners. So we've we've really found what feels like a solid niche of a, of a of a technology stack that allows us to stitch these things together, avoid the vendor lock in, um, build the the, the in-house knowledge um, that that we need to be able to integrate and uh, iterate on, on the platform. But to be able to have the other side of that be something that we can put into version control as intellectual property. And if we choose to move over to another platform that might be GUI based, we can take that that DSL because at its core, that's what it is. Yeah, I basically have one slide left uh, for you, right? So if you maybe want to talk a little bit about kind of the technical, the technical things you, you build with with Camel. Yeah, sure. So when we looked at the integrations that we needed, um, we, we looked across the enterprise. We needed to consume data from a number of different sources across a variety of different transports. Um, we build out integrations that do something as simple as pulling a legacy database table, looking for new records, very basic change data capture, a select where the timestamp uh, of a created at happened in the last one minute. We can do that with one single syntax of, of DSL with, with a, a, a timer that will ping that table every one minute. The data that comes in gets transformed. It gets transformed into a pretty well-documented RESTful API that is the gateway into this MDM event system that we've, we've built. Um, other integrations include webhooks. We receive webhooks from a number of systems, Shopify, Iterable, Marketo, all of our transactional uh, ESP mail delivery systems. When we blast out any of our 30,000-ish, uh, maybe more, actually, don't quote me on that, but a lot of emails that we send both transactionally, both as, as content newsletters, um, as, as other campaigns, all of that data comes back in in real time. And it comes in from a number of different systems. 
So every one of those systems has one microservice that's tuned specifically for that system with a listener on a REST API that gets routed through AWS and gets routed through service discovery, a uh, little bit of, of HashiCorp console, a uh, little bit of Kubernetes, a little bit of Docker. Um, but ultimately we have some really good DevOps uh, uh, ninjas that have built automation that we can manage as code. So be it the infrastructure that defines API gateway or Kubernetes or our HA proxy, uh, we use automation across the board. We store it and, and, and version control it. And we use things like Jenkins to drive CI CD pipelines. One of the, the, the more taxing and challenging things that we've built from an integration point of view has been kind of the, the volume of event and streaming data. Um, the, the data that comes into our system represents things that affect our users. They affect our customers, our subscribers. Um, and customer service uh, works to resolve um, kind of challenges like, um, I can't get into chronicle.com because I need to confirm my email, but I'm not getting an email. I don't see anything in my, in my inbox. Our customer support folks can log into a single page application that we built that consumes APIs that Apache Camel produces to be able to uh, display real-time event and streaming data that's consumed from Mailgun, which is our transactional mail delivery system. So in near real time, that customer service rep can identify that, well, yes, we did deliver it. It didn't bounce, but um, it looks like we need to talk to Comcast.net because we're on a blacklist and we need to just ask them to whitelist this IP address. We'll take care of that and it's resolved. Previously, that would have taken two, three days. It would have consumed a, a chunk of our sprint because the analysis to try and go to all these systems to, to follow the breadcrumb trail um, would have taken a lot of time. So these, these kind of, of you know, really small microservice-based integrations um, have given us a lot of transparency into a huge volume of data that's you know, ultimately helping the, the, you know, us to be better at our mission. Great. And maybe a final question for you, Jeff, maybe is there is there any kind of advice you, you could give somebody who is thinking about building integrations with with Camel and maybe hasn't done so in the past? Um, is there any kind of advice for them how to get started or what what to take care about? Yeah, that's that's a good question, because, you know, every use case is is different. Um, right. But but ultimately what I've seen from 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 the uh, the data great platform, um, the, the ease of, of taking a source to a destination, um, be, be it uh, uh, consuming from Salesforce to populate into Snowflake for a data warehouse. Um, the ability to add a very small amount of code and click a button and be able to see the output in terms of, of exchange messages in my QA environment, which is in my VPC, so that it can talk to our secure you know, data networks, um, just like that. I mean, literally within uh, a, a, a minute to a minute and a half, if that, we can see the output. So, um, you know, advice, um, think about it in small chunks um, and don't over-engineer and try to um, find the best practices approach um, as opposed to picking the, 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 the lowest bidder on an RFP of a large infrastructure. We've done that, um, and, and in some cases it works. In a lot of cases it doesn't. It works in the here and now, but two years down the road, three years down the road, that, that vendor lock-in starts to kind of, kind of creep. And then we find ourselves at another intersection and, and we hope not to, to approach that intersection for another, another, you know, seven to 10 years. Right. I think that's a great advice. And yeah, I mean, that's basically to, to, to come to an end here. That's basically why we've created Jetic. It's um, it, it makes it even, it goes one step further. So it basically makes it totally transparent. That's super important for us because we love open source. 
and we want to give you the the developers the freedom and we want you to regain control so we don't want to create a vendor lock-in so when we create a JATIC, it's exactly what we were talking uh, thinking about is how can we create a platform which helps and lowers the burden to do something with camel because that's some of the feedback i sometimes get from people saying well it's a little bit complicated i don't really know how to how to use it so basically what we do is we basically create the dsl code but instead of wrapping that into any kind of vendor lock-in, we just push the code into Git and we, we, we deploy your integrations using Camel K, totally transparent, uh, we, we, uh, we deploy that. So what you can basically do with Camel K is you can either do it by yourself using the command line tool, or if you say, hey, we need to have a little bit more support on that, uh, we need a tool and we need a company behind that because that's obviously what people are missing when they're doing open source and why they're actually going into a managed provider or into a traditional platform is because they think they need the support and that's basically where we want to fill the gap and want to say hey we're there for you um we provide the support in apache camel we got 10 years of experience we give you the tool um so you don't create the vandal lock-in you can basically cancel the contract anytime and can can continue doing that by yourself using your git because you've got everything in your git uh using camel k and going forward from that um so that's basically why we created jetic so yeah it was uh, was great having you jeff um thanks so much um it was great talking and um well, i think we're we're basically coming to an end right I believe we are. Thanks. It's been great to be here, Andre. Pleasure as always. Thank you.